So the man who really spearheaded the curation of this exhibition of all these wonderful posters is Dr. Scott Montgomery, professor of art history over at University of Denver. And guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. I, I wouldn't call it guilt in putting together <laughs> such an historic retrospective of such important and influential Artwork yeah. and photography, which is art too. So we're, we're really feeling it. And, and you were talking a little bit about the chronological layout in, in the, the labyrinth inside. And then out here was more about context and history and culture. Why don't you give us the rundown? What are we looking at? Well, I guess to start with, if you give an academic a job like this, we're going to go nerd. <laughs> we're going to go nerd. Um, and so. As a historian, or art historian, we love context. And there's two parts to this show. I mean, this is the context. And the way I sort of see it laying out is that we've got kind of the socio-political climate, and then you've got the kind of psychedelic climate, which I include beyond just the drugs, there's also the Krishna consciousness. It was paradigm expansion all around. You know, yoga and LSD. LSD was easier, <laughs> but, but um, so there's that. And then I call it like hip commerce. We've got hate street to main street. Because part of the counterculture was creating its own culture mm -hmm. and its own commercial culture, the psychedelic shop. I then see the rock poster as kind of a subset of hip commerce, because it is commercial. And even the concerts were commercial. So this sets up kind of that whole cultural moment and then on the inside, we have, I, I sort of, I have my own subtitle for that, which is Seed to Flower. Seed to Flower. Which is the name of the essay I wrote, because the seed is the first rock post, artistic rock poster, George Hunter's The Seed, and then the flower being Summer of Love. So the challenge there was to chart really the evolution of an art movement. And I vehemently argue that this is an art movement. The joint show is the manifesto. But so I started, you know, I got asked to do this. I started looking, I said, well, let's go almost week by week. And that to me was so interesting to chart. And you can really see this, these evolution. Artists are problem solvers. And you can kind of see, all right, how do I tackle this problem? And so the layout in there, you can kind of see there's the simple ones. Then Wes Wilson in early 66, really taking on architectonic letters and all that stuff pictures with letters. And then as you start, what surprised me is I said, then it's really summer of 66, you start getting the appropriated images. So all, all the characteristics we see, you can almost watch them develop as they go. Mm -hmm. Color's always been in there, there's always been bold color, but woof by the end of 66. Mm -hmm. You know, Moscoso's colors, jeez, they're intense. You know, well, he's a master. He studied with Joseph Albers, the preeminent color theorist. So he's bringing that to bear. But you can kind of see this evolution of you know, them building. It's the building blocks of the psychedelic poster movement. And so Seed to Flower walks us through, I would say, the evolution of an art movement. It's not the end. The, where, the, where this show ends is, I think, in many ways, right as it starts hitting its full peak, which I think continues for a couple of years. So what we're tracing is, I, I say, the, the embryonic evolution up to the big flowering moment, which I think the end of 66. 1966 is the critical year. You start at the beginning. They're relatively simple. They're not even artistically interested, for lack of a better way to put it. Some of them are just simple posters. By the end of 66, I mean, you've you got the Skull and Roses. You've got Victor Moscoso's Junior Wells with that cast. And it's it's in peak form, it has hit its pinnacle, which I think keeps going. Because if you look at some of the, the sort of simple overview of the history of it, you know, there's that sense that it all peaked there and went downhill. I'm looking down the hall at Rick Griffin's flying eyeball right there. That's January 68. And it's like, 
Let's process that. That's kind of the pinnacle. That means the pinnacle kept going. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, we all, that flying eyeball is one of the biggies. Yeah. Hello. Um, <laughs> Modeling up, it, flying so, up. And, and again, Lee Conklin, who I think is one of the most psychedelic masters of the lot. They're not a second wave in a sense, but they're kind of a build of the crest. It's sort of how I, and so looking at this play by play, both revealed the conscious steady evolution which you can do with the rock posters because there was a concert every week. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the thing. We have this chronology that you go, doot, 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 so you can watch evolution. Where, with a context actually like this, they come from different times, it's different. So that evolutionary layout was super eye-opening. Um, and then it also really set up this idea that the, the peak of this movement, I think, goes for a couple of years. And I think I would say by late 66, we've hit full bloom, as I'd like to call it, seed to flower. Um, and I'm trying to use the term, the psychedelic spring, capitalized, because that's what came before the summer of love. Okay, psychedelic um, spring, yeah. And so I don't know if it's going to catch on. But my, <laughs> my thing is, the psychedelic spring was when it was very much a San Francisco thing. Yeah. And this is 66, and I'd say up through the first half of 67. And then it was a local kind of, you know, the human beings, early 67. It's, you know, a lot of folks from San Francisco who were there say that 1966 was their summer of love. That's when it was ours, as, um, and Victor Moscoso told me that he calls the summer of love the summer of distraction. He said, because it was just everybody coming in cool. But so what we're tracing here is when it was really a, a small culture developing a very specific aesthetic that is culturally grounded, politically grounded, probably recreationally grounded, before it kind of erupts. You know, wh when does the rest of the world discover it? Well, you've got what Time, in, Time Magazine and Newsweek doing these features in March and April 67. Right. Uh, so that starts to open it up. In the floodgates, right? Exactly. Well, people, yeah. you know, people in Boston. Oh my go, God, we gotta get out there. Oh, exactly. Because of course, there's, there's an, how do the images travel? Only by poster, or postcards, probably with the cheaper way. You know, so they get over to England. They get all, but it's it's a little slower. It takes a little bit of time to sort of get out of. I don't want to say the cryogenically sealed culture, but the localization. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think a little microcosm. Exactly. When it was really a an internal cultural language, and the summer of love, among other things, open it up. As an art movement, it doesn't go away. You know, even the death of the hippie parade, which I just learned last night that um, one of the reasons Bob Schnepp's wonderful um, poster of the the summer um, summer of love poster with St. Francis the stars. One of the reasons it's so rare is that was used particularly to plaster all over the coffins for the death of the hippie because how appropriate this, the Summer of Love poster. Like, oh, so they all got used up and thrown out. I mean, so, you know, those, there are these weird little backstories. It's kind of poetic in a way, though. No, it's perfect. Of course <laughs> they, they'd use they that. Put it to rest, um, effectively. It, it's funny how there are all these weird little backstories that ex often randomly explain. You know, because I got it. It's like, what, they just print a few of them? Why are there so few? Ah. Now it, I get it. You're right. And, and probably that's not the only one, but it was emblematic. And I think in a weird way, that whole death of the hippie thing was, was no, our culture's just been taken over and diluted. Once you have Main Street copying, I mean, there's a, I don't know the year. It might be 68, might be 69. There's a Playboy magazine cover that looks just like Wes Wilson's designs. Wes did not do it. It's one of those, once you have that going on, you have the mainstream having co-opted. Yeah. And so what we're looking at here, the context is when it was local. This is what happened here. And then you go through the, the evolution. This is how it happened. Mm. And I'm an art historian, so I'm interested in how it, there are influences in a movement, and then how that plays out in stylistic traits and things. Um, and that's what I set out to do. Mm -hmm. Let's look at it as an art historian. Nick Merriweather, I understand you were an enormous influence in the team curating this exhibition. 
And so I'd like to hear from your perspective when you're determining, okay, what, what is this about? Is there anything in particular that you want to teach or convince people or help them learn or understand? Or is it more just the tribute to this, this incredible art in the period? There are two big arguments that this exhibition makes. And the first argument, and sort of the fundamental one, is the one that Scott Montgomery really championed and pioneered, which is taking this art seriously as, as a legitimate art movement. And what I really brought to the, the table was looking at it not just from the standpoint of art history, which is Scott's uh, forte, I look at it more from the standpoint of cultural history. And so the two things that probably appealed to me most strongly, I liked the argument of taking it seriously as an art movement, but I'm also interested in the politics of American culture. And one of the things that I think makes this art so successful is the degree to which it really did embody the counterculture. And I think that helps explain its stigma as well. I think because it was so successful at capturing a zeitgeist, at, cap at capturing that counterculture ethos, uh, that's in turn what made it possible to then deprecate it after the heyday of the counterculture passed. Well, that simply makes this art kind of passe. And I think art is always of its time, but it also transcends that time. And I think the interesting thing about putting together this exhibition was seeing the degree to which this art still continues to resonate and speak today. You're stressing the legitimacy of the art as, as artistic uh, merit. Yeah. And so are there any artistic styles out there that you would draw comparisons or influence, you know, yeah. cubism or prismism or, or, or um, you know, surrealism? Or what, what, what were they modeling so. after anything? Or was this just such a departure you can't even no, really, <laughs> link it? You can actually trace a lot of clear. Um, Art Nouveau is a huge influence. And I think that gets fused in San Francisco with the Victoriana. They kind of get that turn of the century. Of course, the line. Now, the, the quality of line is, is tremendous in this. And I think that linear fluidity of Art Nouveau is a huge influence. Mm. Sensuous art, it, it, it alludes to that sensuosity that resonated. Um, so Art Nouveau is huge. I think op art, you have some op art patterns, but the color, that whole color in Moscoso is trained by Albers, who's not an op artist, but his color theory. So I think you've got Art Nouveau affecting the line. You've got op art really punching the color. You've got pop art because all of this appropriated imagery, all of this high and low, it's part of this. I think those are kind of the three big components. And I think I've tried to identify loosely four traits. Okay. Not all posters have them. It's like a Venn diagram. Um, but line, sensuous line, bold, dynamic color, um, appropriated, repurposed imagery, and then lettering. Oh, yeah. And that comes, of course, also from, I mean, Wes Wilson's lettering. A lot of his early stuff comes from Alfred Ruler, a Viennese secessionist artist, who was displayed in 1965 at Berkeley. There was a Jugendstil, which is German Art Nouveau, essentially, um, exhibit. Wilson didn't go to the exhibit, but he saw the catalog. Mm. And some of the letters and motifs come straight out of Alfred Roller. So in a weird way, even the Vienna Secessionists and Art Nouveau set the template for the dynamic lettering, but there's nothing in turn of the century lettering that it comes close to. Must go to lettering. Yeah, and, and Conklin's wow. illegible stuff. And Griffin. Yeah, um, yeah, especially those weird ambigrams and things he sticks in. So I think you can tie it as an art movement. You can see the influences, but they're not slavishly, they're not copying Art Nouveau for Art Nouveau's sake. They're just drawing from it. And then they, you know, I always think you throw it into a great artistic blender and you get this. Uh, and you get, you know, the masterpieces of, of line and color and appropriate or surreal imagery. That's one or the other, of course. Ambiguous space, ambiguous figures. That's, an, I guess, a, a fifth element. Mm -hmm. That's the quintessence, perhaps, of the whole thing. 
As far as the art itself, and we talked to the art historian, and this is known as the psychedelic art, but what, what are the influences that you see or the other types of artistic styles that, that you can identify in the work? There's a fascinating blend of artists being self-consciously artistic in the sense that they are looking at antecedents. Uh, you know, they're looking at Art Nouveau, uh, which was the first great poster movement in American history. They're very clearly steeped in that, but they're also steeped in a whole host of associated forms. You know, everything from circus posters, which were also part of that era as well. I mean, circus posters, the heyday is from 1890s through the 1930s. Um, they looked at, you know, every single kind of, every genre and facet of, of poster art and drew upon all of that as well as a whole host of associated uh, things. So I think it's, it's an interesting testament to the artist's ability to put themselves both in a self-conscious artistic trajectory is also in their own time. And I think the balance between those two is what makes the art such a powerful and evocative uh, cultural expression. It's a great segue of being a powerful uh, cultural expression. Uh, you know, this representing them, what was the counterculture so desperately trying to say? You know, and are, aren't those messages still relevant today? Kevin Jess. <laughs> and I would say that's perhaps why the interest in this art has never never waned or abated. And in fact, in many ways, um, if you look at the prices that collectors now routinely pay, you know, there there is an entire industry devoted to buying and selling this art. And I think that's a very powerful indication of the degree to which that art continues to resonate. How about the, the resonating impact of the counterculture itself as you know, iconified by these posters. Right. Like the, we want people to recognize that there is a deep and powerful resonating influence from the 60s today that we still feel that we want to really, you know, help encourage people to bask in their appreciation of what we have today that we can credit with them. So, what what mean, comes to mind? Well, it, it's huge. I, so much political consciousness evolves from this. Mm -hmm. Even when, even in the cases where the counterculture might have not always been like feminism, there's a dual relationship with the role of women there. There's a lot of objectification, but there's also empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you can see some of the roots of modern feminism, gay rights, the idea just of rights, of individuals mattering. Um, it's one of the few places that I've encountered with interviews where people said race wasn't the primary issue. That, that, that there was this transcendence of all the superficial difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the cultural, I can't say political, embrace of us. And I always say, let's get away from the me in America and get to the us of the US. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it sets that template. So there's human rights, there's just paradigm expansion. Frankly, I think the internet you know, everything could be six degrees of separation for the grateful dead. True, true. But, but, true. but because who thought of, why, why is all that tech revolution out here? People thinking out of the box. How do you think out of the box? You get over the box. Mm -hmm. And, okay, I think LSD and marijuana helps some people. Yeah. But I think it, it was a paradigm shift. And if we talk about the internet, what else has impacted modern society? As much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so I think it can loosely go back here. And of course we have marijuana legalization now that things take generations. It's of course two generations is about what it takes. Um, and I think um, rights, basic rights, LBGT rights, mm -hmm. it may not have been at the forefront mm -hmm. in the counterculture, but the ideas that you know, like Rick Griffin says on one of his posters, everybody is good at heart. And I think at the end of the day, that's the takeaway. Mm -hmm. And everybody is I, true. I think the counterculture succeeded if we look at the long view. Mm -hmm. It's changed the way we think. The counterculture won. America just hasn't owned up to it yet. And we're better for it. We want to help people realize that some of the attributes of our current lifestyle, we can credit to the 60s counterculture, the summer of love era. What would, you, what would you point to today that, that sort of proves that that's been effective. The fact that cannabis is now legal in several states, including California, that would be, I think, one of the most striking things that people would point to. But I think it's a host of, of 
other things as well. And I would say, in no particular order, I think uh, an awful lot of the triumphs of the counterculture are things that we now quietly take for granted. Yeah. But I think that, you know, always, uh, liberal and progressive values are, are always hard won. And they are things that, it's exactly like, you know, environmental protection. These are not battles that are then are won and then we can move on from there. They're battles that are constantly having to be fought. And you can never be complacent about those ideals and those ideas. You always have to, they always require their defenders. Could they have known at the time how impactful what they were doing, you know, could possibly have been? I think the interesting thing is that's probably one of, that's the bittersweet aspect of the 1960s is there's a wonderful quotation in Hunter S. Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas uh, where he talks about, and it's, it's really kind of the, the most moving passage of the book where he says, San Francisco in the 1960s was a special place. And I, I can't do justice to the quote here, but you know, essentially he says, uh, there was a moment where we felt like we were all winning. And I think many people at the time, if you, if you think of 1966 and 67 as being kind of the peak of the counterculture, which in many ways it was, uh, then I think they would have said, no, I think we are winning. I think we are going to prevail and persevere. And I think the sad thing about it is, in many ways they did, but in many ways they didn't. So what did you want people to, to learn from this or take away from it? That's a good question. You know, be inspired or... To me, there's two takeaways I want, and it's kind of emotional and intellectual would be one of the things. I want the wow effect. Mm, because just look cool. at the stuff. <laughs> get it. All crazy, psychedelic. And that is part of its intention. Yeah. So the overwhelming wow effect, you want that. But... Why? Why do you want them to care about the posters? Exactly. Well, exactly. Why, why, why? why? Because it's great. No, yeah. But, but also, not just because they look, but because they're they're historically significant. Yeah. They're cultural artifacts. So a, a cultural historian, um, and Nick's one of the best cultural historians around. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, he, only the Grateful Dead archivist. He has a brilliant way, mind to approach this. Um, God, I just derailed my thought. Um, oh, what do I want people to do? So. You know, you want people to just go, wow, because that was its point. Part of its voice is that. But what it does, the wow factor draws you in. Yeah. Then you deliver the goods. Yeah. And that's sort of what I really want. I always call it stealth pedagogy. Cool. You got to slip it in there. What are doing with your stealth it, pedagogy? Make it look cool. But then what do I want them to walk away from yeah. this? Understand that this is, was grounded in a cultural, historical, political moment that created this hot house, and that it was a very consciously care. These weren't just a bunch of hippies scrawling on napkins. Mm -hmm. Frankly, the artists were a little bit older. They weren't teenagers anyway. They were sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want them to see, because I think a lot of the general public thinks, oh, this crazy hippie art. This is, this is toulouse Lautrec for the 20th century. Right? And in my discipline, in art history, we've been very slow to embrace these posters because it's the trifecta of doom, right? It's rock and roll, pop culture, and graphic art, which for some reason art history doesn't seem to acknowledge graphic art as important unless two of the track or Albert Durer are in on it. So it's an inconsistent field. I keep thinking, there's nothing wrong with it being graphic art, and that's part of, it's a more popular art, and that's part of its purpose. So I, I want it to be taken seriously as the art movement that it is, mm -hmm. because these are, I think, some of the top-notch artists of the 20th century. Mm, wow. Yeah. I'll, go, I'll go on camera to say that. I go. think these are some of the most extraordinary artists of the 20th century. This is, in my mind, one of the great American art movements, mm. as is the Liquid Light Show. That's the other one, the Liquid Light Show, Liquid Light which we'll get there. Yeah. Um, some down, you know, maybe years down the line. But, but it needs to be acknowledged. This was very, you know, we should be proud of this stuff. Right, right. So what do you want people to walk away from here with? Uh, a sense that this art is a legitimate artistic movement and that even more to the point, 
I think it's art that deserves to be taken seriously as art. I think it's uh, an absolutely American art. I think the fact that it was mass produced and widely celebrated and consumed and continues to, to matter today, I think all of those things are not just important, but I think they're also emblematic. I think they, are, they go to the core of who we are as a country and as a nation. And so I would hope that people would leave here thinking this really was an art movement and it is an art that still continues to matter and it is an art that is uniquely evocative and informative and powerful. And uh, I hope they leave thinking about, well, I hope there is an echo and a manifestation of this that will happen today. And I look forward to seeing what that might be. Mm, let's bring it on. Yeah. Future's always exciting. Yes, indeed. I love to rap with a hug. Oh, I like that. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah.